Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to the webinar on how to write and submit the research manuscript organized by the International AIDS Society. Before we start the webinar, we'd like to thank Viv Healthcare and Gilead Sciences for supporting this webinar through the Educational Fund Program at the International AIDS Society. My name is Alberto Rossi, I'm the GIS Managing Editor, and I'm joined by Brooke. Brooke, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi everyone, I'm Brooke Nichols. I am the Senior Director of the Impact Department at Find in Geneva, an Associate Professor at University of Amsterdam, and I'm a JIS Deputy Editor. Thank you, Brooke. Um, so uh, let me go to the next slide. So this is the agenda for today. Um, the, the webinar will be structured in two parts. Uh, the part one is all about a manuscript. So we'll give a brief introduction to JIS, uh, our journal, and then we'll go you know, in, in depth um, on the manuscript structure and how to write each section. On part two, uh, we'll give you an overview on the process of submitting and choosing a journal and what is you know, happening behind the scenes once you submit a, a, a manuscript to a journal. And we'll cover you know, an overview of the publication ethics. So overall, at the end of this webinar, uh, we hope you will have learned a bit more about how to write a research manuscript and you have understood a bit more about the editorial process for an article publication. Uh, just a couple of uh, notes about um, how the uh, webinar will, um, will develop. So there is a Q&A section. Uh, you can use that. If you have any questions, you can start asking your questions at any time. We'll try to respond to them um, during the, the webinar on the chat functionality, on the Q&A functionality, and we'll, we might have to pick some uh, to respond live at the end um, of the webinar. The recording of this uh, will be uh, you know, made available on the IAS Plus platform. So uh, please make sure to check it out. And if you have any questions about the, the workshop, you can email us at the email address that you see here that we will also uh, share in the chat um, soon. So just a quick introduction about the Journal of the National AIDS Society. Our aim is to provide a platform for the dissemination of essential HIV research, and we encourage submission from low and middle income countries. And also on top of this, we aim to provide capacity building opportunities for early career researchers. Our journal is online only, is peer review, is open access, it's in factor 6.0. It's indexed in the major repositories. It's multidisciplinary, so we cover from clinical science to behavioral and social sciences. And again, uh, as I mentioned before, one of our uh, goals is to provide skills uh, building opportunities for young researchers. Okay, so um, why would you want to publish an article? Um, so you know that's uh, that's a whole point of uh, of this uh, webinar. From a scientific point of view. Results that are not published mean that the research did not take place. So you have to start with that idea in mind. Um, you know, you want to make sure that your ears, that you are investing your research, ultimately will be published so that everyone in the globe can uh, benefit from your research. And during this uh, webinar, we will, um, you know, we'll try to make it as interactive as possible using a virtual platform. So we, we will ask you some questions um, that you can reflect on and then respond and then we'll discuss the results. So the first question we have for you today is what makes a good manuscript? Is it because the, interesting, the topic is interesting? Is it because it's adequately, adequately uh, powered sample size? Is it because it has a good scientific question? settings of interest or all the above. So we can launch the poll now and we'll give you, you know, 15, 20, well, 30 seconds to respond. And then we can discuss together um, the results. And the, the responses are anonymous. So don't be shy. You, know, you can respond whatever you think is the correct answer. No judgment. All right, we'll give it another 10 seconds. All right, I see that 69, 70% of you responded. Uh, so we can end the poll now and look at the results. Okay, so uh, the results uh, indicate that 78% of you responded all, all of the above. And indeed, uh, that's what we think uh, makes a good scientific article. All of these points are important in order to have 
a good article. All right, I think it's now on you, Brooke. Yep. Thank you. So six things that you wanna start thinking about before you actually start writing your manuscript. The first thing you really wanna sort out is why you wanna publish your work and whether or not it's going to be publishable. Then only do you then wanna figure out what kind of manuscript you wanna write. Is it going to be a research scientific manuscript? Is it a comment? There are different types of manuscripts out there. Then choosing the actual target journal that you wanna write for and making sure that you're writing for the, the audience of the journal specifically. Paying attention to the journal requirements and guidelines for authors. Um, editors really like this when you pay attention to those guidelines. Then you need to pay attention to your structure of the paper and also understand the publication ethics to avoid violations. Next slide. So I am a big fan of writing. I almost use scientific manuscripts as a way to think about the research that I'm doing. And so the first thing that you want to start with is ordering those thoughts. First, when what you're working on, you want to think of, have I done something that's new and interesting? And what gaps did the study actually address? How did my study address these gaps? And then trying to really figure out what's your story? So if, is this something brand new to the world of science that has never been seen before? Or is this something that has been shown in, in neighboring countries or has been shown in different contexts and you want to be able to demonstrate it? I think often students might get lost um, and early career researchers thinking that they've been scooped, but really figure out you, the research you're doing might always have an angle to it that provides something new to the literature and really trying to sort out what is that gap that I'm addressing here. Then you can sort out what are your key findings from your research. Then you need to sort out, can I make my work replicable? Because a lot about publishing is making sure that your research can be reproduced by others. You want to think about how confident you are in your work, um, making sure that it is indeed publication worthy and it's going to withstand peer review. Importantly, ensuring that your conclusions are justified and not overstated. And then really thinking through, especially in a more applied journal, thinking about what are the implications for research, practice, and policy that are coming out of my work. So really trying to take the time to think about critically, you know, how are people going to use my results and what can they be used for? Next slide. So the structure of your manuscript will really depend on the type of article that you're writing. So there are different types like review articles, debates, comments. Um, but for this, we're going to mainly focus on, we're only going to focus on the research manuscripts. And so each journal might have specifications that might, this might differ a bit here and there, but this is really typical of what you see in most journals, um, especially in a, the type of clinical sciences that we are in. And so you st usually starts with the abstract, as most of you will know, followed by the introductions, methods, results, which will have all of the tables and figures, followed by the discussion and, and the references. Next slide. So just because an article follows a certain order doesn't necessarily mean that that's the easiest way to go about writing an article, starting from you know, your title going all the way through to your references and you're done. In turn, we typically recommend that you start with the figures and the tables. So this is sort of the meat of your research because it will help you figure out what is the story that you want to tell. And those figures and tables really help sort of help clarify for you, for the reader and trying to tell your story. So starting with those, then focusing more on um, once you have that, then you can really start on an outline. And so when I work with students and trying to, some, sometimes the most difficult thing is getting the first words down and knowing that there's an, an order that you can follow and ways to get sort of the words down can be really helpful. So you know your figures and tables, then you might wanna start setting up your article. You can start with the title page, put your title up there, the authors, don't forget middle initials, <laughs> that a lot of people use. Um, 
and really follow what's typically required of a title page, which will be different from journal to journal, but you should be able to um, look that up for each individual journal. And in terms of writing, starting with the methods, because then you can really clearly articulate what is coming out of those figures and tables. Then you can think about the results section. So what are these results actually saying? And then, and then you can think about the introduction and discussion, because that might help make it less sort of overwhelming with those sections um, once you have sort of the meat of your paper already there. And only then, when you have sort of your full article, do you then want to go back and actually write the abstract? Because the abstract might seem relatively simple, like, oh, it's, it's short, I should start with that. And I, I've thought that in the past. But really, once you have your full manuscript, your story, it becomes much easier to come back and then say, okay, now I can summarize all the work that I've done in a really concise way, and that will be my abstract. And then you can follow um, with the acknowledgments and references, and there's different sections that different journals might require from you to make sure to do all of those. And of course, throughout this whole process, you have, you'll be discussing with colleagues to try to figure out your story. You might have those figures and tables, and you're not sure what story it's telling. Ask your colleagues, ask your I call frolics, your friend colleagues, um, make these presentations at meetings and conferences to get feedback on your work. It'll really help, help you figure out what your story is that you want to tell. Next slide. Okay, poll number two. Why is the title of a paper so important? So everyone, your poll should pop up. Give everyone 10 more seconds to respond. Again, we can't see your answers, so respond freely. And the results of our poll. Yes, so you'll 53% of respondents said all of the above. So it's the most often read, it's often the only part read discloses basic information, helps the reader decide if they want to read more, mini advertisement for your paper. Um, and so we think really it is all of the above. Um, so it is essential that you really think about your title because if it's going to be the only thing that some people read, you want to make sure it accurately, accurately represents what it is that your study is about. But, but it must also be short, very specific, representative of all the work that kind of went into that manuscript, be informative, and give you the what, where, who, and how of your article. And it is absolutely your mini advertisement for your paper. Um, and it does in fact give that basic information about your manuscript, about your article, and can help readers decide if they wanna go into depth or not. And as someone that has done a few systematic reviews, it also really helps people who are doing systematic reviews triage your paper, because you might first look at the title and only then perhaps look at the abstract. So it's essential that your title is very um, accurate. So most often the only part read, then you get to the abstract and then the main text. So it's very much like that ice cream cone that you see on the right. Next slide. Okay, so let's look at this title together. And what kind of information is missing from this title? So we have metabolic causes. Let's see. Yes, your poll. Do we have the what, where, who, or how? What might be, be missing from this, this title? everyone a few more seconds. And the results? The how, exactly. Next slide. So most of the respondents said the how. And so the what was the metabolic causes of liver disease, who, which population are we talking about? So adults living with HIV, the where from low and middle income countries. And what was missing was the how. 
so what kind of study are you doing exactly? And in this case, it was a cross-sectional study. So when we added that in, it gives you the full what, who, where, and how. I'll hand it back over to Alberto. Thank you, Brooke. <clears throat> okay, so uh, we now know everything about a title. Um, let's uh, see what's next. Uh, next is, sorry, next is the abstract. Um, so the abstract is a short version of your article, and we like to call it a standalone summary. What standalone part is really key because you, you want the reader to understand exactly what you did just by reading um, the abstract. So it needs to be standalone. So th th that's really key. There are four uh, parts in the abstract that we recommend uh, you follow. This is pretty much universal in all journals and conferences um, that you might go to. So there is an introduction which uh, describes the issue, the knowledge gap and what your study aims to do. Then there's the methods section um, that uh, describes what was used and what approach was taken, uh, the results, so what your study uh, found, and then the conclusions, um, which is you know, a, a brief recapitulation of the, the outcomes, and then implications and recommendation for future research. So it's important, the, the abstract is brief. So you only have a few words, you know, in our journal, for example, is 350 words. So in that little space, you need to, put as much information as possible. So we recommend that you do not go beyond what's established in your paper. So if something was not part of your paper, why would you want to put it in the abstract? And do not include in the abstract any non-significant results and do not speculate in the abstract. So um, this is a good uh, way of thinking about um, the abstract. People don't read the old article unless they have a vested interest in the topic. And many people rely on reading the abstract to decide whether to read the entire article. So as Brooke mentioned before, readers will suffer the title. If they're interested, they will most likely continue with the abstract. And you need to make sure that your abstract catches or keeps um, their attention so they continue reading the full article. So what we're going to do next, um, we are going to look at this abstract. Uh, and I'm going to try to show you how well uh, the authors managed to put a lot of information in just a little uh, space. So they put a topic. So liver disease, the leading cause of morbidity and mortality among people living with HIV. And then they put the issue. There is limited information about the burden uh, of metabolic disorders on liver disease in people living with HIV. And then they put what type of study design they used, um, and then they indicate the study period, so October 2020 to July 2022, and then um, they include the study population, and then this, they included the study set setting, so the, the region where this was uh, conducted. And then they go on, they describe the methods. So clinical assessments, laboratory testing on fasting blood, uh, blood samples and liver stiffness, and so on. You can read that um, later once we share the, the recordings. So again, they describe the methods very well. And then they describe what they're looking at. So their outcomes. So as much as um, we think this is a very well um, prepared abstract, there is one thing missing, or at least there's one thing that is not um, explicitly uh, written in the abstract the way that you would want to do it. And that's actually the aim. So you can see that in, they never say here what their study aims to do. Of course, they describe the issue so that the knowledge gap, and you know that implies that the authors are looking into that, uh, but you will want your abstract to be uh, straightforward in um, disclosing what the aim is. And then we can look at the two uh, other parts of the abstract, so the results and the conclusions. So we won't read um, all of the results, but you can see that they describe you know, what they found in their study. And then regarding the conclusions, they, they nicely put in just a few sentences, three key uh, concepts. So the take home message, metabolic disorders were significant risk factors for liver disease among people living with HIV in low and middle income countries. So that's the take home message. And then indicate what this implies. Early recognition of metabolic disorders risk factors might be helpful to get clinical and lifestyle intervention. Okay, and then they go on and they provide some suggestions for you know other peoples 
um, or the researchers of what we should be doing next. Further, prospective studies are needed to determine the causative natures of these findings. So again, you can see that in just 350 words, uh, they managed to put a lot of information and that's what you really want the abstract to be. And I'm gonna end it back over to Brooke. Thank you. And now getting into the meat of how to actually write the research manuscript. Next slide. So even though we said that this isn't going to be the order that you might actually write it, we will go through in logical order of how you'd actually read a manuscript. Next slide. So first, your introduction. This is where you wanna be very clear. What is your research question? And fortunately, most journal articles, most people that write them, follows a pretty nice formula. First is your background. What is the topic that you're talking about? Second is the context. What do we already know about this topic? What previous research has been done that might set the stage for what we're doing? Then you wanna go into the challenge. So the nature and the importance of this knowledge gap that you are filling. And then the final piece might be about the, will be about the actual aim of the study. What are you trying to do and why, and what gap does it fill? So really what's the aim? And so really you wanna start from very general. So your first paragraph might be very, very broad in terms of describing the issue. And then as you get towards the context, through the context challenge and question and aim, you get more and more specific. Next slide. So here, this is an example from an introduction section. And so let's read it together in your own time and identify what element is missing. We've highlighted some of the key sentences from the introduction to assist with more rapid reading of this intro. But everyone take a moment and think about what element is missing from this introduction. And next slide, the poll will pop up and you can still look at the abstract, but really, or the abstract introduction. Please select what you, what element you think is missing from this introduction, the background, context, challenge, or aim. Next slide. And let's see the poll, yes. So most people, 74% agree with, with us at least, that it is in fact the question or the aim of the study that is missing from the introduction section. Next slide. So if we go and we look at how they have structured the introduction of their article, very much how we've described the background is very clear. In high income countries, liver disease is the leading cause of morbidity and mortality among people living with HIV. Um, and then you go on to the context. And however, data on liver damage due to cumulative exposure to those older ART drugs remains scarce, especially in LMICs. And then there's the challenge aspect. And so liver Steatosis is therefore a major concern that requires early recognition of persons at risk of liver fibrosis to prevent liver-related complications. But then well, it doesn't really tell us what you're gonna do, what the, what the authors are gonna do to address this challenge in this manuscript. So when we get to the question and aim of the study, you'll see that they include, we therefore hypothesize that, you can read the rest, but really making sure that that final paragraph in the introduction is really setting the scene. What is the question you are going to answer? And then that last sentence, in the study, we aim to estimate. So very much, what is the question you're going to address? And then what are you going to actually do in the last sentence? So methods. 
how do you actually address your research question? Your methods will differ depending on the sort of how you approach them and what your subheadings might be, might differ depending on the type of research that you're doing. But what you want to ensure is that you're showing the reader that your methods are appropriate to answer the question that you had, the research question you had. The methods need to be detailed enough that your work could be replicated. So you want to include all the procedures, interventions, types of data collected, the analytic approach, statistics. And what I find extremely helpful as a reader and a writer uh, and an editor is using subheadings to organize your content. It can be really helpful also when you're writing that you have these sub sub um, section head headers can kind of, you know, it organizes your thoughts. Okay, I need to make sure I include information on this, on that. And we'll get into the, the details on types of headers you might want to use. Methods are also the section where you want to be sure to include any information on IRB or ethic approval, ethical approval uh, and patient consent. And you really want to make sure you're writing in the past tense for your methods section. Next slide. So methods are not a place for results, just for the how-to, the how your how your research was conducted. And so when you're writing the methods, you can get into extraordinary amount of detail, but you do need to balance details with the actual word limit. So you have to really be concise in your methods. And you want to answer your who, your when, where, what, and how. So who, who is was the subject of the study or who was targeted by the program or intervention? When did the study take place? Um, when was a program actually implemented? When were you evaluating it? Where was this, where did the study take place or where was a project implemented? What was measured? What factors, what were the factors of interest? And the how is essential. So how was a study designed? How were the outcomes measured? How were data collected and how were data analyzed, et cetera? So it is this balance, and this is in a section where reviewers can often, you find that reviewers will ask for additional information. And then when you we'll get into responding to reviewers later, when you respond to reviewers, you really want to make sure um, that you will come back to this balance between details and word limit and really needing to make the choices between how much detail you can give within the word limit provided. And so this is an example of another article which has the method section and you'll see all of these lovely subheadings which again very helpful so in this you'll find that um, the subheadings here that were used to organize their content were was the source of the data the design population outcomes and statistical analysis and so your subheadings this is not hard and fast but these are the subheadings that you must have it very much depends on the type of research that you're doing as a model or an health economist, my subheadings look very different, but I still use them very regularly. And so if you're trying to kind of get some inspiration about what subheadings you might want to include, you could really look at other articles in your specific area of research and see what kind of subheadings are other people including in this space. Next slide, results. Okay. So, the results section should be very sort of, this is not where you get to speculate on your results, but very much state what the results are. So not interpreting them, but purely stating them. And so not, so this is the results section should be focused on the key findings of your study. Not every single piece of data needs to be presented, but you should be very specific. The date should be specific, numbers, percentages, confidence intervals, and the results should also have statistical analyses, depending on the type of research that you're doing, but that represent the main findings. And we wanna be really careful with the word significant because significant means something um, specific in statistics, statistically significant, and also be careful for using any kind of vague terms. So some, many, few, these are kinds of words that don't have actual significance behind them, significant <laughs> behind them. And so it's better to just actually state what the result was rather than using those terms. Try to use visual representations of your data whenever possible. This really helps the reader 
um, understand what you did and get a feeling of your results. And you don't want to repeat the same data that you have in text that you have um, in tables and figures. So if you have everything in a table, you wouldn't want to go through in your results section and write you know, one sentence for each data point that you have in your table. You can refer to the table and tell us what the key findings are from that table instead. And so you don't want to use them. Um, they, they shouldn't just duplicate each other, but really be additive so that your words can help explain what the key findings are in what you're showing in your tables and figures. And finally, really wanting to make sure that the text and tables um, flow logically. And we are very much in this, this sort of funnel ice cream cone examples, but it should start pretty broad and then get to more and more specific. So you might have descriptive data all the way down to your multivariate analysis, sort of most complicated and specific analysis at the end. So organizing your results in a logical way is key. So this will help the reader really understand what you did and be able to follow along. So if you look in our example, if you look at the paper, you'll see that the authors organize the results into three sections and the flow is really very smooth. So they start by describing the study population and then move on to describing the details of the two measurements they base their research question on. And then following the same logic of the objectives of the study <laughs> presented in the introduction in the square box up here. So this is very much following from our, this is the, the, the sentence that came from the introduction. And then this is indeed how the results are going to be presented. So most broad to most specific. So now we have another example. This is a section of the results and everyone take a minute or two to look through and think and think through, is there anything wrong with the way that this is written right here? So you can see the poll next to you to guide your question you're thinking about as you read. Give everyone another 10 seconds to respond. Next slide. So 71% of us said the data could be more specific and we agree that the data could in fact be a bit more specific. So here is, for the purpose of this exercise, we have changed some of the wording and now you can see the original, the correct version of the manuscript um, with the results description. And so notice how the description needs to be specific and accompanied by the actual quantitative data. So instead of more than 2000, it's important to write the actual number, a total of 2,210 people living with HIV. Instead of the dates being one year to another year, the actual month and the year to the other month in the year, making sure you're including your ends, in this case, for every single of these parameters that have been listed. And then instead of aged approximately, use the precise terms. So of overall the 2,120 people living with HIV, had a median age of 50 with the confidence interval, your, or in this instance, your interquartile range. And then what does the majority mean here? The majority meant 56%, so that was put in there. And then when they said significant differences between participating countries, then the p-value was inserted at the end to actually show this value, the, the extent of the significance and that that was a true statistical significance of that result. Next slide. Okay, so tables and figures, the most fun of the manuscript in my humble opinion. So they're helpful, use one that's more helpful to convey data than text alone. And what's 
really important is that these should be standalone, that you should be able to take out any table, any figure from the manuscript and know and be able to understand what it is about, which would mean you need to have a clear title for the figure. The axes should be labeled, columns and rows should be labeled. Any additional data required to understand this figure on its own should be included in the legend, including any abbreviations that have been used in that figure. And the types of tables or figures that you use, they want use them appropriately so that they can actually help you convey the message that you want to convey. So some types of research will have very clear, you know, you need a descriptive table, you need a, you know, clear stats sort of examples. Some might be you have different kinds of data you can display in different ways. And so be do be careful with colors and thinking about um, that if you have any colors that are too close together, it might be difficult to differentiate. Considering uh, color blindness, that might be an issue. So making sure that your colors are robust against that uh, potential color blindness of your reader. Also consider that this might be printed in black and white at some point. And so do your colors, can they um, still withstand that test of being in black and white? Can you still differentiate? And so <clears throat> here are two examples. On the top, you have a figure with a clear title with your axes labeled, with clear color differentiation. And this could be taken out and standalone. You know what the data mean and what they are. And then the bottom of the bottom, right? You'll notice that there's a lot of um, information in the legend. And this really helps to ensure that, that table can stand alone. So the notes that we know what data are being presented, what are the um, uncertainty, Estimates are inter quartile ranges that, so we really could take that table out, put it on its own in a slide and it could stand on its own. Next slide, over to you, Alberto. Thank you, Brooke. <clears throat> so um, we got the abstract, we got a title, methods, results. Uh, next is the discussion. So how did the findings address your question or, or aim to study? Um, so these are the things that you, you will want um, to cover when you're writing your discussion. So first of all, did your results um, address your question or aim? How do your results compare with other studies? Are they general, generalizable? What are the implications and what are the limitations um, of your study? Uh, do not overreach. So if you did a specific study, don't you know, um, take it too far with the implications and, and conclusions. So um, to, to, to best explain this, we're gonna use again an example. Um, so this is a part of the discussion of the paper we've been looking at multiple times so far in, in the webinar. You don't need to read this, um, but um, we are gonna be looking at specific sentences in this slide, which we highlighted um, so that we can make this a bit more, um, a bit faster for the purpose of this webinar. So um, they start off by saying in the discussion we found. So you can already tell that in you know, this first paragraph, it's a brief uh, summary of what the, the results are. And then they move on and they start uh, comparing and contextualizing um, their study with others uh, in the literature. So you can see they say it's consistent with previous studies. And if you look at you know, the following sentences, they say you know, a study performed in Brazil, and then a study performed in three countries in West Africa, and then studies from China. So you really want to make sure that you look at the literature uh, available and you, you sort of take your study and compare it directly to these other studies. And I'm gonna add that this is particularly important for journals such as our journal. We are the journal of the International Aid Society. So we could potentially consider a study that has been done in a single region, but because we are the journal of the International Aid Society, we will want to make sure that that specific study from that specific region is sort of, you know, put in the context of the globe. Um, so we really recommend that you, know, you focus uh, on, on this section by comparing with other studies. And then um, they briefly uh, introduce what their results uh, implicate. So these results suggest that liver disease related morbidity could be significantly and so on. 
And then they conclude um, the uh, discussion by highlighting what are the strengths and the limitations. And I cannot stress enough how important this is because we all know, we all can agree that no study is perfect. All studies have strengths and limitations. And it's important you're very open and straightforward about this because if you pretend not to indicate in your study what are the limitations, the editors, when they have to choose whether your article is worth being published or not, they might think that you're not aware of the limitation of your study, which is a bad sign. Instead, you know, if you know that your study has a limitation or multiple limitations, you want to be very open about those and indicate them in the concluding part of the discussions. And this will help the, the editors first and then the readers to sort of contextualize even more your study. So for example, here, um, they, they start with strengths and you know they say what are the strengths, you know, large multi-center multi cohort. But I, I particularly appreciate it in this article that in the limitations, they say given the cross section. So if you look at the, um, the last sentence in green, given the cross-sectional nature of this study, we could not draw formal inferences between liver fibrosis and steatosis, and, and so on. So you know, this is really important. This is goes back to the study design, which at this point cannot be changed anymore. But the authors are very open and say, well, this study design, cross-sectional study, as a limitation. So make sure you take that into consideration when you um, think about how well, you know, applicable these results are. All right, and then last part of the, of the paper is the conclusions. So you want to uh, briefly uh, re-mention the key take-home messages of your study, emphasize what are the implications of your findings and provide some future recommendation for colleagues uh, that will build um, their studies on your paper. Do not use space to put in obvious statements. Do not repeat completely the results. Do not overgeneralize. You know, we always make this example. You know, if you have done a study in a particular region, you cannot assume that the exact same results will be applicable in a different region. So keep that in, in mind. Again, what we're going to be doing here is provide an example so you can see how well the authors managed to put these three concepts into the conclusions of the study. So they provide in blue the take home message. So pretty much what they found in the study and then what their um, results implicate. So they basically are saying here that um, that you know, with these results in end, you can um, you know make some policy changes so that um, these you know these, these conditions can be screened earlier on in the process. And at the end, they provide some recommendations for <clears throat> for future research so that um, the direction is already given as to what should be do, should be done next. Okay, so we looked into pretty much everything about the manuscript. I'm gonna give you a brief um, you know, recap of what we discussed. So introduction, you start wide, so from the big background, and then you follow that channel, um, that you know, fu funnel channeled approach. Um, so background, the context, the challenge specific to your study, and then what your question is. And then you're gonna write the methods, the who, where, what, and how, <clears throat> and when, sorry. And then you go to the results, follow a logical fashion, do not discuss them, just present the data yeah, you found, and then the discussion and conclusion. So again, an intro paragraph, contextualize and compare your studies, be open about your strengths and limitations, and then provide the conclusions. We want to remind you once again, that intro methods and results should be written in the past because these are things that have already happened. Uh, discussion and conclusion should be written present tense because this is what is happening um, now. Um, okay, so to recap, um, a good scientific article has to do more than just present a lot of data. It must tell a clear, compelling story. So you really want your reader to have fun uh, when they read your article. Okay, then we are getting into the second part of the agenda. So we looked into how to write the manuscript. And the second part, we're gonna give you some tips on how to choose a journal and what happens once an article 
is submitted to a journal, so the editorial process, regional projections, and some publication ethics. Um, over to you, Brooke. So first, how to choose a journal and submit a manuscript. Next slide. So finding the right journal is really a three-part exercise. So first you wanna identify your primary audience. So who do you actually want to read your article? Then you're gonna identify journals and then select two or three journals that you might consider amongst those that you've identified. So for your target audience, you wanna think about in context of your, your research question and the story you wanna tell, think about who do I need to reach with this message? Which readers would actually find that this research most useful? And what fields or disciplines match my topic? So is it very sort of methods focused and I might want to stick to a methods journal? Is it more content related to a specific health area like HIV and something like JIS would be most relevant? So thinking about the types of people that might benefit the most from reading our article. Then what type of journal should I publish in to reach that audience? So you might consider um, that sort of general interest or a specialized journal. Maybe something is more appropriate published at a local journal or regional journal, given the content that you want to communicate. Think about open access or um, if considering whether the journal article is going to be open access or subscription based, because that will really affect your audience. If you really want a broad audience, especially for people that might not have access for these paid for journals or subscription based journals, do consider the, whether or not that article is open access. And finally, think about the reputation of the journal. So really making sure that we're not, um, we're staying away from predatory publishing. Who are the editors and the editorial board members? Are they reflect who's um, is it that area of research? How serious is the peer review process? So is it very rigorous? Are they really getting proper peer reviewers that are looking at your, at your research? Is the journal indexed? in a legitimate abstract um, and indexing services. So are there, can you actually find this journal article out there perhaps on PubMed or different kinds of repositories? Then you can also think about what the impact factor is, which is some indication of how often the articles that are published in that journal get cited. Um, so that really is about that kind of impact and reach of each individual paper. Um, are the publication fees, if there are any, are they been clearly indicated to you? How many articles are being published by that journal? Is it tons? Is it relatively narrow? And then do colleagues that you are around you have experience submitting to that journal? Because you really want to make sure that this is a reputable journal that you are submitting your research to. Next slide. So I wanted to add this in here, finding the right journal. This is a tool I use all the time. Her name is Jane. Um, and what this can be used for is to help under, help give you an idea about what kind of journals are out there that published work that have a similar title of the work that you're considering. Can I actually share my screen? Is that allowed? No, I can't. It's fine. Um, but you can put in the title of a manuscript that you are working on into this. You can click then find journals for given the title of your article. And then it will give you this list and give you different confidence of each of these different, um, each of these different journals. So in this instance, the journal title or the article title, a new model of integrated chronic care outcomes of integrated HIV hypertension blah, 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 were titled. And it said, based on that title, a journal that is most likely to um, have articles published in a, a similar topic, that first one was, had the most, BMC Health Services Research in this case, but do explore this website. And just because it's listed here does not mean that the article is appropriate or the journal is appropriate for your research, but it gives you a good sense of, okay, what kinds of journals can I look at and what might be most closely matching my type of work? So you can click around here, say show articles. It will show you the other articles with similar titles that have been published in that journal recently. The article influence will give you an indication of impact factor mostly. And this service, this, this AI tool, whatever you might want to call it, that in yellow, it says high quality open access. So it will give you an indication, is this, or is this journal open access? Will people be able to read my research widely and openly once it's available? 
And is it indexed somewhere? So here it says Medline Index, and that means that the journal article is indexed in a reputable space as well. So you're not in the... So do you think carefully about where you might want to go? This might provide you some good sort of first steps. Next slide. Thanks, Brooke. I'll, I'll take it from here. Um, so these are um, recommendations that we highly encourage you to follow um, because um, I've been working in editorial office for a long time. I can't tell you how many times we receive articles that simply do not meet um, the format or the requirements that we have, and each uh, journal has different requirements. So we really recommend that before you start preparing your article, you decide where you want to go to, um, following the uh, suggestions that Brooke uh, shared, and then you, you format, you prepare your article. So check the journal webpage of the article that you think is best for you. Check a recent uh, publication to see you know, more or less how that looks like. You can also use some um, other uh, websites that are listed here, and the, the links will also be posted in the chat. For you to, to look into. Um, I, we can share what we most often see uh, as ignored instructions, uh, word count limit. You know, if you know our word count limit, for example, is 3,500 words for a regional research article, if you send us an article that is 6,000 words, it might be a fantastic solid article, but we simply cannot um, accept it. Um, so please do make sure that you follow the instructions. The formatting, for example, tables and figures, should they be in the text, at the end of text, as separate files? Are the figures um, of resolution that is sufficient uh, for publications? Are you spelling out all your abbreviations? So these are things that often authors ignore because they think they're not important, but I can guarantee that from the editor's perspective, showing that you paid attention um, to these aspects um, shows that you really curated your article at the best of your capacities, which is very important. Um, here are some common reasons for rejection. Um, scope is an important one. So we are, for example, an HIV journal. If you submit an article to us about, I don't know, cancer, for example, very likely this is not going to be accepted, even if the study could be you know, very well done. Um, are the objectives of your study uh, clearly described? That's important for us to see. Are the results important? Will they have a, you know, an impact on policies or you know, prevention? So that's, that's also a component we look into. Are they novel? So for us, for example, novelty of the data is an important factor. You could send us a perfectly done study with data collected 10 years ago. We will not be able to take it because we look for more recent um, data. Is the study design and methodology valid? Of course, that you know, sort of goes without saying, but we will want to make sure that the science behind the way you did your study is sound. Is the presentation of good quality? You know, that goes into you know the flow of the reading, the language quality. And we understand that you know, many of us are not you know, a native speaker. You know, that doesn't mean you, you, know, um, you, know, you still should, you should still you know, make sure that you know, the grammars and syntax of your study is you know, as best as it could possibly be. And then uh, does the manuscript follow the journal guidelines? And I you know, stress that D because each journal, unfortunately for you authors, each journal have different guidelines, so you, you want to make sure that you follow the guidelines of the journal that you've chosen. Uh, and then we're going to get, so once you submit the article, then the editors, you know, if it's a good study, they will send it out for peer review. And so that's when colleagues, you know, or peers will look at your study. Here we will provide you a few suggestions on how to respond to the peer reviewers. So it's important that you respond to every question that they make. Do not skip something because the editors and reviewer will simply, you know, understand that you didn't want to respond to that question, which is a bad sign. So be specific, you know, when you respond. So if you get a bullet list uh, of points or questions from the from the reviewer, make sure you say, okay, question number one, you know, question, and underneath you put your answer, specific numbers, specific lines where you made those changes in the text, 
uh, so that the reviewer and the editor um, can clearly see what you what you change it. Sometimes we get responses from the author saying, oh, thank you for this point. We made the necessary changes in the article, but we can't tell where the authors made those changes. So you really want to be specific so that the editors can you know, easily go to that point and see if the response was satisfactory. And then you can disagree with the reviewer. So if the reviewer made a comment that you don't agree with, that, that's fine. You, know, um, you can disagree. You just have to motivate why politely why you disagree with the point um, made by the reviewer. Keep it short, straight to the point, try to be constructive. You know, it's not helpful for the editor or reviewer if you respond with a tone that is not positive or constructive. Um, here I'm showing um, a quick example of what I just um, you know, presented. Um, so on black, you can see the reviewer's uh, question and then the authors underneath with a different color, sort of like in a different uh, you know, line, they provide the author's response, they you know, argumented that, and then they say this statement is included in lines 217. So the editor and reviewer can go straight to that point and see how they change it. Um, these are some of the publication um, ethical aspects. I'm going to go fairly quickly because ideally we have a few minutes to respond to some questions. Uh, again, the, the recording will be shared so you can look into this. Um, you know, be careful about using your um, citations. Be careful, very careful about plagiarism. Plagiarism is when you copy parts of a different article without providing the reference. All the softwares now can detect this. So, you know, 100% of the time you will detect it. And that's, you know, an easy reason for rejection. Um, redundancy. So don't use the same data, or the same study for multiple publications. That's not, you know, um, the correct way of doing it. Uh, make sure you are correct when uh, giving authorships. So only people that meet certain criteria can be listed as authors. Disclose any com conflict of interest. You know, for example, if the study was supported by a pharmaceutical company, that can be fine, but you have to disclose it in the article. Uh, make sure you have the ethical board approval. And of course, you know, fraud is to fabricate data, so never do that. Um, these days, we're also facing challenges with artificial intelligence. You know that now some tools can basically generate uh, articles or part of the articles. Again, um, I'm here to tell you that's not correct, and we can easily detect that. Um, this is an interesting article you can you can look into, but you know there are um, you know long story short, um, these artificial intelligence tools are not capable of replacing uh, humans uh, yet. So anything that is artificial intelligence generated can be easily caught and can lead into fraud. So be very um, judicious about uh, this. Uh, here are some useful resources that I will share in the chat for you to, to check. And um, now we're gonna have uh, five-ish minutes maybe uh, to respond to some questions uh, that you might have. There are some in, in the Q&A that we'll try to respond. Um, before we end um, the, the webinar, we would like to invite you to complete the survey that you will receive shortly after uh, we end the webinar. That's a, that's a good way for us to understand how we did and how we can do better uh, for the next um, sessions that we're gonna have in the future. So with this, I'm gonna stop uh, sharing. I will try to... Uh, pick uh, some of the questions. So um, again, we need to be super quick, but uh, there were some questions about qualitative uh, studies. So JIAS does accept qualitative studies. For qualitative studies, we have a higher word count um, because qualitative studies most time implies that there are quotes uh, in the article. So we allow for additional, um, additional space. Um, there's another question about if the article is rejected, can I correct and resubmit? Well, nothing prevents you from doing it, uh, but you really need to look into the, the reasons for rejection. If the reason was that the study, according to the editors, was fundamentally flawed, it's very likely that the editors will not 
want um, to take that study again because they, they their understanding is that there's nothing that can be done um, to correct. Or for example, in the study period, if we think the study you know is too old, you know even if you resubmit, um, that the data is still too old. Um, okay, there was one that I wanted to respond. And Brock, feel free to pick any any question that you see you know, for the next couple of minutes. There was one question uh, about um, how do I balance um, uh, de you know, information in the methods? Well, there is no universal rule on this. It's more like an art uh, that will come with experience. In principle, you will want to provide enough information so that the study can be replicated. That's the, you know, the general rule. We understand that, you know, it, you know it's a bit difficult, um, but the, you know, the editors will be able to say, well, we think you've done a good study, but we will want to see more information about um, the methodology to be sure that, um, you, you know, you, you followed solid um, processes, or you can use sometimes the um, supplementary information where you can add additional uh, material. We, for example, we get studies about modeling and you know they can't they cannot include all the algorithms and details or all the you know documents that they used into the main text, but they can provide additional um, support information files that include um, those information for those readers that are interested in what's basically behind the scenes. There's a lot of questions about ethics and IRB approval. And I think Alberto did comment that you need an ethical approval for work that you do before you start your research, not just for the publication itself. Um, but there are instances where you do not need ethical approval. So for example, modeling papers that are using, you know, that are not using actual patient data, but are actually generating data through modeling. Um, systematic reviews, you would not need ethical approval for, but anything that involves patients people <laughs> that you're actually using the data from, you should check with the IRB in the countries that you are in and sort of the requirements around that, but typically IRB and ethics are are required. Thanks, Brooke. Um, one question about cover letter. Um, not all journals uh, take the cover letter, we do. And what we recommend is that you know, briefly, you highlight uh, what are the strengths and weaknesses of your study and what uh, is the impact of your um, of your publication. Make sure you address that to, to the specific journal you're sending this to. Um, it's really there is no you know specific rule for this, but it's your way to highlight what really is good about your study. And then there was another question I'd like to answer, and then we have one more for Brooke if you want, and then we're gonna have to uh, end this. Um, there was a question about the ethics uh, for the review process. So um, the review process is in JIA's list. We use uh, a double, uh, a single blind um, method, which means the authors do not know who the reviewers are, but the reviewers know who the authors are. And we do this because it allows the reviewers to potentially disclose any conflict of interest they might have with the author. So they need to know who the authors are. The process is very um, rigorous and uh, and transparent. There are no bias, you know, based on author's affiliation, country, uh, financial contributions. Any of this is uh, screened and and assessed in in our journal. So we can guarantee that there is no uh, bias on that. And so the last question I will take is about how do you approach when you have two contradictory reviewer comments? Because this happens to me all the time. But typically, you as the researcher, I mean, you know your work and you will probably agree with one of those reviewer comments or the other and really critically think about it in the context of your work. What, Which one do you agree with? And then you can respond to the one you agree with and perhaps take their, you know, you take their feedback into consideration, make the edits appropriate, and then respond to the reviewer who thought something the exact opposite, saying why you chose and you agree with this other reviewer and you can reference your response about why you responded in that way. So reviewers are humans, we're, uh, you know, we're other researchers and we have our opinions, of course, about how things are. So you, I mean, you're also allowed to, to bring that to it as well. And so reviewers will often disagree with each other, um, but just think about it in the context of your work. Thanks.
Well, thank you everyone for the very many questions that you are, um, you know, keep adding in, in the functionality. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to go through all of them. I think there were more than 50 questions, all of them, good points. Uh, we'll try to, you know, we'll collect those and try to make sure that we incorporate um, some of these points in our next, um, you know, sessions. Please do um, fill out the survey. It's very important for us to know how we can improve in this. And thank you very much for taking the time to follow this webinar. And hopefully you will attend our you know, next uh, sessions in the future. We usually do this you know, throughout the year. Um, please share the news with colleagues and friends uh, if you liked it. And uh, thanks again for your time.